Good evening. This is May Brussel. It's broadcast number 708, and it is July the 1st, 1985. Now I have the uh, task of trying to give a picture and overview of Simon Wiesenthal. I call it a task because to take a person that's catapulted into such a position of fame and fortune, he's parlaying all of his uh, pile of bones into a uh, shouldn't talk about like that, but I do because I think it's total disrespect of these people that he has shown. In my eyes, he wants to parlay that into a hundred million dollar building in Washington D.C. I'll be giving you the details on that and get permission. He's gotten it from the Parks Department, I believe, to parlay the, his, his fame and fortune to a twenty million dollar center in Beverly Hills on Roxbury and Olympic, wanting the California taxpayers to foot. Five million of that, and he hopes to be a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize. And yet, this man has never been a source of controversy. He's lauded, he's loved, everybody sits at his feet, and nobody has taken a part. Who is Simon Wiesenthal? What has he done? Uh, how does he cover up these truths? And that's why I say it's a task because it's hard to get some people to understand the deceptions, the layers of deceptions around us, and what people will do specifically for fame and fortune and, you know, sell their soul. Uh, that's the history, the story of Faust, and, and it happens over and over again. And it's a terrible tragedy, not so much for the person who does it because he doesn't really care, but it's for the people who believe, the victims who believe, who have the means of finding out the truth and don't use it. That's the tragedy. It isn't that there's any secrets about this person. It's that people want to believe what they're told, and I might go further in a few minutes on why I think that happens. I Just for a brief second, and I've had this on the air many times, there are four reasons that I'm tackling this subject, and we'll be doing it for the next two or three weeks. One is the lying about Dr. Herman Urban's existence in uh, Austria, where he lived, and telling uh, Charles Hyam, the author who was working on the untold story of Errol Flynn, that Urban was not in the area and had moved out of the country. Urban had such close contacts to Rudolf Hess, to Hermann Goering, Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and to Hollywood at the scene where the blacklisting is to come, where Senator Joe McCarthy made the biggest uh, uh, harm to any industry, changing the whole nature of Hollywood and casting and write, screenwriting. And Rudolf Hess, before he flew to England to try and coax the powers that be to be that... Uh, uh, he would work with them and help uh, conquer Russia, that Germany and Great Britain would unite. It was Rudolf Hess's genius and skill that organized all the Nazis in South America. That was his haven, South America, so that if Hitler lost the war, he could take America by having his stronghold in South America. So Urban was important for those reasons. The next thing is that uh, Wiesenthal has lied about Martin Bormann. Bormann affects the American banking industry, our economy, our loans that are probably just disappearing into Swiss banks. The effect of the banking uh, collapses in this country, what it could do to America, what it's doing already. The loans that were uh, given out that can't be paid back. The economy, I think, can be directly affected by a living Martin Borman, and I know Martin Borman is alive, and he lies about that. Another matter is that Simon Wiesenthal lied uh, about uh, Mengele being an American citizen. The papers from the FBI cited this Nazi Joseph Mengele and his having been in Arizona, and Martin Mendelssohn, the attorney for the Wiesenthal Center, wrote a letter to me that it was not the same uh, uh, Joseph Mengele, and I know they're lying because the way I got the documents, and I've mentioned on the air, was that somebody contacted me who I knew who was with his uncle and sitting with Joseph Mengele in the Honduras. That's how the whole thing came up, that he was sitting with him. So therefore, I know the man is a pathological liar. For what or why or how, I don't know, except that he was sitting with Joseph Mengele, and this was the truth. And that's why this person sent for the Freedom of Information papers on Mengele from the FBI. And also, I'll illustrate in as we unfold the uh, Wiesenthal story, the relationship of Simon Wiesenthal working with J. Edgar Hoover to protect no Nazis in this country, no Nazis who 
can affect policy also. And so the final blow to the Wiesenthal story, and I've brought up these other things before, is uh, telling the untruth that Joseph Mengele is dead. There's a reason for all these things, of course, and you just have to look for the reasons in the person, the personality, who they meet, and uh, where they are associating with at this level today. And it seems that uh, Simon Wiesenthal always had very, very important contacts. Even as he, as he exited the last concentration camp, he and Prince Radswell, the soon-to-be pretender to the Polish throne, were leaving arm in arm and went on to Western Europe to do their thing. And the story of Radswell has to do with I.G. Farben, among other things, and also his Monte Carlo connections to existing Nazis and the Cold War and the relationship of Wiesenthal to Radswell I'll go into in a few minutes. It's also important because if Mangley was doing medical work for our government, he was delivered money down in Brazil in American dollars. If, in fact, he was uh, sterilizing Indians in Paraguay and doing medical experiments, the diseases we're seeing now aren't far removed from the goals of people like Joseph Mengele, such as AIDS, the multiple births, the enzyme diseases that can knock out particular races. And uh, save the articles that if you've seen in your papers in the East or North on the cheese scandal, the 50 deaths and the cheese people dying and the um, babies being aborted from eating cheese in the Mexican Chicano community. I'm going to fill that in for you later. Diseases like Alzheimer's, Legionnaires, swine flu, and so forth. I'm very suspicious of our intelligence community and the Nazis that continue the experimentation on diseases as well as mind control programs that were related to the mentality and to the person of Joseph Mengele. He wasn't just hiding in a house all that time. That is a lie. There may be a time period where he was staying in these homes, but they were safe houses and there were seven of them, six or seven of them, and nobody was with him a lot of the time, and he had mobility, and it isn't true that he was seen every other day. And then, of course, if the Fritz Kramer story is true, meeting with Hans Steinecker in uh, Zurich of April 12, 1985, the association of Fritz Kramer with Daniel Graham of Star Wars, with Henry Kissinger, who Henry Gonzalez, uh, the Democrat from Texas, referred to as the hired gun, Two years ago, he asked Congress if the State Department has leased to Henry Kissinger. All of these people have direct links to Klaus Barbie and Joseph Mengele and the top Nazi network in South America from the day of World War II to the present. And therefore, they touch bases with people that Wiesenthal associates with and knows, accepts money for, uh, has lecture at his institutions, and uh, it's very important now to reappraise Simon Wiesenthal. During these years, he has never made a boo about uh, Herman Apps going to the Vatican Bank. I called attention to that immediately after the appointment was made when the scandals broke in Italy, the P2 Masonic Lodge and the link of Vatican to the missing money. He didn't worry about the Waffen SS wreaths at Bitburg, and I'll give you in a chronological story the account of Wiesenthal and why I think he didn't object to that. He didn't mind Otto Ambrose coming to this country, the scientist who conceived of and patented Zyklon B for Adolf Hitler, or the fact that J. Peter Grace, his partner, gets an appointment as a, at a cabinet level with Ronald Reagan. He doesn't object to Western goals with a member of the Luftwaffe and uh, people from the Waffen SS working closely with John Singh Lab of Western Goals, uh, Edward Teller on the board of Western Goals with these people. He never speaks up about any of those events that affect America, fascism in America, fascism around, fascism around the world. Uh, he entertains people directly related to those organizations and is associated with them and doesn't blush or think anything about it at all. Wiesenthal Center had no comment about Richard von Weisecker becoming the current president of Germany with his father, a defendant at Nuremberg, and the liaison of Hitler to Pope Pius XII should tell you a lot about the future of Germany and the Cold War as it heats up under Ronald Reagan. And the Wiesenthal Center is a subject you can write a book on all the things they've never dealt with or take the past 14 years of my radio work and see the subjects and titles and ask yourself, 
where was the Wiesenthal Center? They did send Rabbi Heyer over to the Vatican when Herman Apps was put on uh, the paymaster for the Gestapo for Heinrich Himmler, Adolf Hitler, when he was put there in the Vatican as an advisor to the bank. But Rabbi Heyer came home, and Apps is still there for all purposes, so he certainly didn't have much influence. A book came out just this month called Vital Lies, Simple Truths, The Psychology of Self-Deception by Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N. And the minute I saw that book review, because it's time that it just came out this past week, I thought how how great this is to see this at this time. It was June 16, 1985. If you want to go to the library and copy it or buy the book or ask for it, I thought of how many people seem to accept the story that Joseph Mengele is dead. And what is in their heads? If you read any of the accounts of this thing, there's no reason to believe he's dead. And why do people believe him? Why do they believe Simon Wiesenthal or Romeo Tumo, the chief of police down in San Paolo, or the Mossad that works so closely with uh, Straussner, General Straussner down in Paraguay, and with the military dictatorships in Argentina and South Africa and with General Somoza, only linking up with the military death squads that have Nazis in them and associated with them. Well, Vital Lies and Simple Truths is a book that that describes how some people have information or ideas or fears they only share with a friend. Now, I have people that have listened to this broadcast for years who listen alone or buy, subscribe to the tapes, and they share them maybe, if they're lucky, with one relative or one friend. Their husband doesn't listen or their wife doesn't listen or their son, or their children, or their cousins. And it's something that they only have to themselves, and nobody else can share it. And then this book on lies and deceptions goes into the analysis of why some people have some truths or facts in their lives that they don't even want to tell themselves that they bury them. And I know that there's long subscribers to these broadcasts that have listened many, many times. And often I'll bring up a name or event, and it's already gone that it, it's so important to connect, but people can't keep that right in its proper perspective. It, it would be uh, changing their whole frame of reference around, about the world, so they let it all slip away as if it didn't happen. And this particular author, who's the book reviewer and also the reviewer for New Psychology Experiments and what's going on in this country for psychology, and finally wrote his own book, said the group decisions have found to be influenced by group think. The tendency to suppress contradictory evidence and to suspend critical judgment so as not to deflate the group's esprit de corps. And he goes into the way, if a group says that this is the way it is, such as in the Joseph Mengele case, they said there's a consensus of opinion that he died, therefore he died. The evidence can't support it, but the consensus of the group think passes to the group, and therefore it is so. This book also says that as members of a society, people acquire and share frames of reference that dictate which acts or events should be attended to and which should be ignored. In other words, if you're going out this past week, you talk about the hostages. You don't talk about Mangley anymore. It's no priority to a lot of people. Well, it may not be in the newspapers now, but it will be the subject of a movie I know that's coming out, of new books coming out. I understand Peter Dale Scott is doing one on the Odessa Connections, an area that I've been trying to get the researchers into for 20 years, and there will be a lot of material. But the subject of conversation in the past weeks, it's like the Mengele thing is over. And this author says, A society's painful history is rewritten, whether on the pages of textbooks or more subtly, in well-learned rules about what questions can be or cannot be asked. And he refers to post-war Germany, where people had no idea or said they didn't know because they didn't want to know. And in conclusion, just based on this review, which I'm going to be sure to get, it tells you about the problems of allowing these things to happen. He says when you have collective amnesia, for example, the events of the Nazi era, and you have blind spots, individuals have, have blind spots, then it will come back to you in some form or other. You think it's convenient now, so you suppress it, and this is a book on how you suppress it, but sure as heck will come back to you. And the author says, people overlook the white lies of others, first as a matter of civility, later as a matter of habit. 
I'm very proud of you people who listen every week to the radio and subscribe to the tapes because you are a select few that this doesn't apply to except that how far you take it after you have it. But you people are very sophisticated in that you're not afraid to listen to truth or listen to information and then check out if I'm right or wrong. I don't, You may not think it's true, everything I say. A lot of people don't agree with everything I say, even though I do. <laughs> but you don't have to. But I give you the sources every week, and you can check it out. And you're certainly not afraid to hear it. But are you afraid to pass it on? Now, the day after the case was closed, uh, the investigation in Brazil, it took 15 days from the opening to the end. The Los Angeles Times has a story, page 12, 99.9% convinced on Mengele, Simon Wiesenthal says. And all he needs is just a little bit more, but he's 99.9%. He is letting his name immediately. That's a good investigation. He, In his interview, he said he was a little, little disappointed that Mengele's second wife, Irene, has not yet cooperated with investigators. He said, would somebody tell me, who else in the family has cooperated, has the first wife, has the son, has the daughter-in-law, have the nephews? He singles out, if only Irene, you know, the song, oh, Irene, if she would come through, you know, then we'd have that extra 1%, and I'd be 100% sure. That 0.1%, he's depending on Irene. Well, you better not depend on Simon Wiesenthal if he's depending for 1%, 0.1%, not even a whole one on Irene. Now, Simon Wiesenthal, after the war, and I'm going to jump around on the chronology of the man. I want to take it in sequential order, but I also want to bring out certain points. After the war, he was working at Camp Glasenbach, G-L-A-S-E-N-B-A-C-H. He said, I was often working there during that period. I worked for the War Crimes Commission, the CIC, which is the Counterintelligence Corps, and the OSS. Later, he worked for U.S. Uh, intelligence, Counterintelligence, and the Army Intelligence. But in the book, The Murderers Among Us, which is part biography and part autobiographical, he describes being at a camp where a famous prisoner was, and this was Gustav Stengel, who's going to change his career later. And I'll go into the connections to San Paulo, Brazil, to Simon Wiesenthal and Stengel. But I do want to bring out the point here that he was in the CIC, the OSS and U.S. Counterintelligence Corps after traveling through 12 concentration camps, separating from his wife in 1942, reuniting with her in 1945. Now, he was at a camp in charge. One of the people there was Fritz Stengel, who goes down with the Volkswagen people to San Paulo, Brazil. We'll get down to that in a little while again. Henry Kissinger was Counterintelligence Corps under Fritz Kramer. He was in charge of Klaus Barbie. And the American Swastika, written by Charles Hyam, mentions and goes into the subject that uh, Klaus Barbie was in charge of Joseph Mengele. So again, the connection of these people in 1985, and remember back to the days right after the war, where Simon Wiesenthal is in the CIC and the OSS and U.S. counterintelligence and U.S. Army working for them, and Henry Kissinger is the counterintelligence group along with other very top Nazis, such as Otto Skorzeny and Klaus Barbie. Then Barbie goes down to Mengele and uh, takes care of Mengele. Mengele is in Brazil, and Fritz Stengel is in Brazil. Klaus Barbie is in Bolivia. Henry Kissinger's connections have not severed from those people, and that's why that Fritz Kramer, the question was Fritz Kramer at Mengele's account, April the 12th, 1985, very important. Now, in the years 1984 and 85, Simon Wiesenthal had a few events and associations, and we can detail them individually later, but just to get a little uh, view of how far he came from 12 concentration camps at this point. In March 85, there was a dinner at Waldorf Astoria for him. Chairman of the dinner was Martin S. Davis, chairman of Gulf and Western. If you don't have the past broadcast I did on Mr. Blue Dorn from Vienna, from Gulf and Western, uh, I can give you the numbers or maybe people who have those tapes that you can hear them. This has a lot to do with Mr. Sidney Korshek in Hollywood and Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra is on the board of directors of Simon Wiesenthal and Gulf and Western. 
was and is closely associated with stock purchased by Michael Sindona for the Vatican, getting back again to the Vatican Bank and Herman Apps and the paychecks for Adolf Hitler. I'm not going to make all these connections for you now, but the fact that the chairman of the dinner uh, was Martin S. Davis, not Marvin Davis from California or uh, Denver, Colorado, but Martin S. Davis, chairman of Gulf and Western, giving a party for Wiesenthal in 1985. That was just a two months before the president was going to go to the cemeteries at Bitburg, which was arranged in November of 84. 1985, the same time in March, a member of the Wiesenthal board, William Bellsberg, B-E-L-Z-B-E-R-G, and I'll do more on that family, the Bellsberg family, a very wealthy family from Canada and a member of the family living in Beverly Hills, giving a fundraising for Wiesenthal Center in Beverly Hills, that $20 million center he wants, and the $5 million from the state of California. George Will was a, at the reception a speaker at that party. May 29, 1984, the Wiesenthal Center sponsored a lecture on disinformation and foreign policy paralysis with guest Arnaud de Borchgrave, and I have brochures of their hosting it, the telephone number at the Wiesenthal Center, De Borsgrave, along with Wiesenthal, was offering that million-dollar reward. And I don't have to go back to Reverend Moon. He's editor of that paper, Moon's Links, to Michael Ledeen. And De Borsgrave also, De Borsgrave, to the lie about the Soviet Union and Bulgarian trying to kill Pope John Paul II. Uh, just think about these names. I'm bringing them out. I'm not going to go back with all their background now maybe later, or write them up in chapters, but associate Simon Wiesenthal with Arnaud de Borschgrave. Uh, Abraham Cooper, the associate dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, has a news bulletin called Social Action Update. And the, one of the references in that newsletter that was reprinted in the Los Angeles Times, uh, or the Herald, I forget which one at the time, October 23, 1984, a year after the Korean airline talking and referring to the Soviet Union's downing of the Korean airline. Well, uh, when Larry McDonald went down, he was chairman of Western Goals, and on the board of Western Goals is Edward Teller, who in March of 85 was writing bulletins and an article for the Wiesenthal Center on the effect of uh, something like the effect of atomic bombs falling on Jewish heads. I have the title of the article, uh, but I just want to tell you, again, the company he keeps. March 29th, 1985, uh, Simon Wiesenthal got an award, the Grand Cross of Merit to Simon Wiesenthal from West Germany. This was exactly 37 days before the president was going to Bitburg. The president knew with Helmut Kohl that he would be attending the graves of the Waffen-SS as early as November 1984, and to show that it was not some mistake, he has a photograph of himself putting a wreath on the graves with the Waffen SS tombstones in the background that hangs in the White House halls today. A number, another member of the uh, Simon Wiesenthal board is Ivan Bosky, B-O-E-S-K-Y. He's been in the news quite a bit lately. He tried to gobble up and buy and manipulate a hunk of CBS stock at the time that Ted Turner wanted to buy, and he still does want to buy CBS, but according to the news accounts in the Security Exchange Commission, they hold that Ivan Bosky's manipulating the stocks, which would favor the uh, control that CBS had over its own stock, which we, means it would go to uh, Ted Turner and uh, that in turn to people like Jesse Helms, who is behind this move. And Jesse Helms has close associations with and is part of the World Anti-Communist League with the Waffen-SS, with the Death Squads and John Singlaub and with Roberta Dobison uh, from El Salvador and uh, is not a very nice person working with no Nazis. And why was Ivan Bosky, a financier, playing with this stock that would go into the hands of those people at the same time he's on the board of Wiesenthal Center? A another member on the board is Mr. Bellsberg from Canada, and they have offices around the country. There's two brothers that are listed on the board of the Wiesenthal Center. Uh, in addition to giving a dinner in Beverly Hills where George Will, one brother, uh, gave a dinner where George Will was the main speaker, uh, and I mentioned that. The other one is closely associated, according to an article I got from in Minneapolis from a friend, to a, a group 
link to T-Bone Perkins. His name's been in the news, a financier, quite a bit. Perkins it sends funds to Minneapolis to Senator Rudy Boschwitz, B-O-S-C-H-W-I-T-Z. Boschwitz is also funded by H.L. Hunt and the Texas oil people, but they're more than oil people. Hunt wanted to start an American death squad, and I'm not sure that wasn't what he started. Along with Clint Merchants, and their names have been associated with the assassination of John Kennedy. And uh, it's very important to realize that the interlocking connections of these various persons and institutions falls and goes right to the board then of the Simon Wiesenthal organization. Wiesenthal is a member of a group called Freedom Incorporated. I'm not going to list the members. They're all right-wing, including Mrs. Solzhenitsyn and a very long list of people. But one of the people in this organization of Freedom Incorporated, along with Simon Wiesenthal, who is part of that board, is Leo Chern of the International Rescue Committee. He was involved with Isaac Don Levine and uh, Spaz Rakin in bringing Lee Harvey Oswald and Marina Oswald to this country. He was linked to the SLA is a CIA uh, story for Ronald Reagan and Edwin Meese of the kidnapping of Patty Hearst and the deployment of the SWAT teams and the uh, attempt to create terrorism in the United States for a future police force. Another person on the board with Leo Churn and Simon Wiesenthal is Norman Redlick of the Warren Commission. And Norman Redlick's partner in on the Warren Commission, Senator Arlen Specter, has been one of the visual members of, of Congress with Senator D'Amato trying to find Joseph Mengele and making connections of the drug uh, links of Joseph Mengele in South America so that the Warren Commission surfaces in the relationship of him to these people. Also, he worked with Prince Bernhard, according to a Washington Post story. I'm going to detail you all of the sentences. The Wiesenthal Foundation in 1979 was 90% funded from Dutch money. Dutch money, Prince Bernhard. Bernhard from IG Farben. Bernhardt from the Waffen SS, Bernhardt from uh, the resistance movement, accused in the book uh, The Betrayal of Arnhem of, of re, you know, holding the resistance movement, which was identical to what Klaus Barbie did, and he was rewarded. Prince Barnard, who goes on to form the Bilderbergers. Uh, the money for the Wiesenthal organization began 90% from the Dutch uh, government, Royal Dutch Shell, and a group of people from Holland. About 70% non-Jewish people gave Wiesenthal his money to get started. So the links to Prince Bernhard are outrageous. And of course, when the war was over in May of 1945, Simon Wiesenthal is lying in the snow and walking along arm in arm with Prince Radziwill. And I'll just go into briefly a few pages of his own account of being with Radziwill and then leaving the uh, as Soviet mo Union moves west, they go to where the American armies are coming. Radziwill is allegedly the pretender. He was. He passed away to the throne. If the monarchy were back in Poland, he was the brother-in-law of Jacqueline Onassis. He is the gentleman that Robert Kennedy, according to Mr. Borkin in the book The Crime and Punishment of I.G. Farben, was working not as a lawyer but advisor in helping hold the holdings of I.G. Farben together after the war. As I say, the son-in-law of Joe Kennedy, a knight of Malta. Joe Kennedy was Radziwill of the Polish monarchy with Simon Wiesenthal. Now, what was Radziwill doing in that environment during the war? When the Nazis were in Poland, they certainly would have nothing against the Polish monarchy, such as Radziwill. I can't believe that they were just at the same camp together of walking in the snow and then surviving. Uh, and then all of a sudden, he has contacts with these international people from all over the world. Those are just a few contacts and names of Wiesenthal in 1984 and 85, uh, including, as I say, the Grand Cross of Merit from the West German government, Helmut Kohl. And then we can go on to a few more details of the Mengele case and then go back to Simon Wiesenthal, who is Wiesenthal. Now, one of the it was a shock to me when I started my research that Mark Lane uh, was not doing what he was professing to do in finding the ways to expose the people who killed John Kennedy. I lived through this with various researchers who later turned out to 
either be sabotaging the direction that the investigation should have gone or were known people with the intelligence community like Bernard Fensterwald, some known, some not known, which role they played, but absolutely putting their foot, you know, tripping you over everywhere you go. Uh, you know, I had this with Bill Turner when he was sent here to do that story with, on Rebel with me on the Nazis. And the problem I had, and literally had to kick him out and force every sentence there that should be there, why did he want to delete it? Uh, we'll take a one minute break and get onto this subject. It's very distasteful about how people do these things, but they do. And the reasons I am not sure of, but we'll share the information anyway in about one minute on some more on Wiesenthal. This is May Bressel. The broadcast is World Watchers. It's a one hour broadcast of news, investigation of news, in case you are late in turning this program in, some people are. It's on every week. It's broadcast number 708, and it's July the 1st, 1985. The Los Angeles Herald, June the, 20, the 30th, just yesterday, had a an article by Rabbi Abraham Cooper, one of the West Coast representatives for the Simon Wiesenthal Center, along with Rabbi Heyer. Heyer is a good name. It's spelled H E I R. You can change it around the other way if you want. Uh, after the t- article's titled, After Mengele, Where Now for the Hunters and the Hunted? And in this article, he says, uh, There's no doubt that over the years, due largely to the lonely efforts of Simon Wiesenthal in Vienna, Joseph Mengele came to symbolize the arch criminal throughout the civilized world, that he was going to find and pull in the arch criminal of the civilized world. Uh, Rabbi Abraham Cooper, incidentally, is associate dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. That's his official title. And I could say that in 1984-85, Wiesenthal was hardly looking for Mengele until uh, the push came on in February when the drug connections came in, and I was needling them, sending information through various people and calls about the Barbie and DeLorean connections for a long time, two years, and the American citizenship papers, of course, that's been just a closed door with them all along, but they never stop giving themselves accolades, and the news uh, gives them an entire half page of the story. Now, in apropos of the Mangley story, the way the Wiesenthal Center works now, and the way they've swung, uh, if I want to interpret the trading of a certain... Oh, I won't be nasty about it. You come to your own conclusions. <laughs> Here's the Los Angeles Herald. I won't come out and say it. Here's the Los Angeles Herald. Wiesenthal is asking for Alois Brunner, B-R-U-N-N-E-R, Adolf Eichmann's top aide in Madrid. Why would he want Adolf Eichmann's aide in Madrid when Otto von Bolschwing, with the links to the Getty family, to Ford Philco, to the Defense Department for Stanford Research, to the corporations in California, the aerospace, to Warner Lambert, to Helene von Damm, our ambassador, to uh, Vienna, who just resigned recently, why would uh, Mr. Brunner be more important to anybody than a man who had the strength and power to promote a man, Richard Nixon, and his contacts through Warner Lambert, put the presidency in the hands of Richard Nixon, a long ally to the German Nazis, and make sure that John Kennedy, if he won the election, wouldn't survive and Nixon would be their president. Why is Brunner more important than Anna von Bolschwing was? in the United States and California in terms of worldwide Odessa network with the contacts he had in every country in South America, the trips to Argentina, and working for the Cabot, the Cabot family from New England, and working for Cabot Cole. Why is Bruner more important? He also mentioned Leon de Grel, D-E-G-R-E-L-L-E-S, uh, Belgium's foremost fascist and German collaborator who keeps preaching the virtues of the SS. Well, if he doesn't like the virtues of the SS, why accept a medal from Helmut Kohl, who's going to the graves of the SS and be photographed surrounded by the graves of the SS? What's the difference? But then the article goes on the Herald, and it says the magnitude of their, theirs and other crimes and the overwhelming apathy toward their almost guaranteed freedom tend to underscore the chilling validity of statement attributed to Joseph Stalin. Now, this is Rabbi Abraham Cooper saying 
that the magnitude of their crimes is similar to what Joseph Stalin said in quotes, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. That's Rabbi Abraham Cooper from the Wiesenthal Center. That's June the 30th, 1985. Now, April the 1st, 1979, Section H3, Simon Wiesenthal was being interviewed. This is 79, about two weeks after the alleged Mangley bones are going to uh, the lie that Mangley died at the beach through the Bosserts and the Stammerts and, and Mr. Romeo Tuma, who deals directly with Wiesenthal later, and I'll get to that in the deals they made. That's why it's so important. April the 20, uh, April the 1st, 1979. Uh, just weeks after this alleged death of the uh, Nazi war criminal Joseph Mengele, he has an interview in the Washington Post, and he's talking about the case of Anne Frank, because there were demonstrations when the play came out in 1958, the Austrian youth saying it was all a lie. And so Simon Wiesenthal was able to produce the policeman, Mr. Silberbauer, S-I-L-B-E-R-B-A-U-E-R, who at that time was an Austrian police officer in 1978, uh, even though he had been in Holland ordering the death of the Frank family earlier. And then he goes on to Simon Wiesenthal, the Anne Frank case must not be discredited because in terms of its impact in, on people, it is more important than the Nuremberg trial, Wiesenthal said. In Adolf Eichmann's memoirs, according to Wiesenthal, he said, Eichmann says this, 100 deaths is a catastrophe, 1 million is a statistic. So in 1979, he was quoting his enemy, Adolf Eichmann. In 1985, with his $100 million building that he wants and his $20 million in Beverly Hills and all of his honors, it changes all of a sudden. It isn't Eichmann, the enemy, anymore. It's Joseph Stalin and the Russians. He's surrounded by the Cold Warriors, the people that want World War III, the past links to the assassination of John Kennedy, the hidden links to of John Kennedy's murder to Martin Borman and Mengele's and that South American connection, the Borman connection I wrote up in The Rebel in 1983. So all of a sudden, the Wiesenthal Center is quoting uh, Joseph Stalin as your enemy because it pays to be against Russia. And it doesn't, it wouldn't get as much bread if you stuck to Eichmann. So the source changed in these years, and just the week after the admission, uh, the forced admission, the voluntary admission, the lying admission, whatever it was on his part, that Joseph Mengele was in fact dead. Now they're using the quotation of Stalin and not of Adolf Eichmann. In the book, The Murders Among Us, printed in 1967, the Simon Wiesenthal Memoirs, the profile is written by Joseph Weschberg, W-E-C-H-S-B-E-R-G, who says that he also was in the OSS with Simon Wiesenthal. There's a time section, page 28 to 29, where Simon Wiesenthal's living conditions in September 42 seemed to be, as you all know, that he survived. Early in 1942, when uh, Gestapo chief Reinhard Heydrich was murdered in early 42, the Jews were rounded up for a wave of terror that leveled towns, and uh, uh, Wiesenthal family were killed. His mother, members of his family, never saw her again. His wife's mother was killed. But he somehow, and we'll go into that in detail, escaped these 12 concentration camps where he'd be lining up with 43 men, 44 people. Then they'd pull Wiesenthal out, and all 43 would be gunned down. Wiesenthal was the survivor of 12 camps to go arm-in-arm -arm with Prince Radzewell. But in September 42, on page 28, it jumps from 42 to April 43, which is nine months, and it doesn't tell you how he's surviving in a camp when all the Jews are really ordered to be slaughtered, and after Heydrich's murder, Hitler really has no more nice guys, and they're going to start roughing up that final solution. It doesn't explain what he did. It's the paperback, and two pages, you already jump nine months. 
time enough to have a baby. But on April the 20th, Adolf Hitler's birthday, it tells how he's going to round up the people from the Gestapo SS who run the camps are going to round up people to murder because it is uh, Hitler's birthday and they want to have a party. And it, it describes here April the 20th, 1943. Hitler's 54th birthday was sunny, a touch of spring in the air. Wiesenthal had been up since dawn painting Hitler posters and swastikas for the big SS celebration at the repair works at the railroad. Right. He and his two Jewish helpers were finishing a big sign, We love you, our Fuhrer. We Lieben on Seren Fuhrer, we love our Fuhrer. And then it tells how he was rounded up with all these other people. 38 were shot, put in the sand pits. He survives, and I'll go into the names who helped him. But what rubbed off on him, I know if you didn't take a certain job, that you would be killed. But he was an engineer and a draftsman, an architect, and he's busy painting We Love You Fuhrer and, and swastikas. And I read this in other articles also. And somehow he is able to get out of all the death traps that everyone around him went into and come out a survivor working for the CIC, the Counterintelligence Corps, the OSS, when it was so filled with Nazis and fascists and people like Henry Simpson, who was warning about letting Jews have any decisions because they would be vengeful after the war, and the anti-Semitism of John J. McCloy and Alan Dulles and William Donovan and the OSS team. It's interesting that Simon Wiesenthal, the painter of the swastikas, for quite a long time at that particular railway yard, comes out okay. Now, on page 40 to 41, it tells about his being at Buchenwald, and people from Buchenwald arrived at the railroad station at Mauthausen, M-A-U-T-H-A-U-S-E-N. That is the concentration camp where he was when the Americans came and liberated it. There were 3,000 people that left Buchenwald, and 1,000 were alive at the time they got to the Mauthausen concentration camp. And it goes on, Wiesenthal remembers a terribly cold day when they were there, a clear night, with the grating sound of frozen snow under feet, and each step was a major effort. He happened to be walking next to a Prince Radziwill, one of whose relatives later married the sister of Mrs. John F. Kennedy. Their arms were linked, and they tried to support each other, but they last they couldn't go, and they fell in the sleep in the snow, and then there were shots around them, and they regained their consciousness, and the rest is history. They they uh, went off into the wild blue yonder, and Radziwill ends up a, a little sample of Radziwill is from the book The Crime and Punishment of I.G. Farben, as I mentioned earlier, by Joseph Borkin. And on pages 220, 221, 213, you can look up in the index, it is indexed, and look at the role of Prince Radswell in trying to hold together the uh, branches of I.G. Farben that were going to be separated and how Robert Kennedy intervened for his brother-in-law. Brother-in-law wasn't only to be the brother of Jacqueline Onassis, the Bouvier family, was very important in France, and as I say, uh, Radziwill was important as the social scene and the fascists and the Nazis he mingled with after the war. So that in this book on the crime and punishment of I.G. Farben, it tells about the intervention of Joe Kennedy, a knight of Malta, along with William Casey and William Donovan and James Angleton, the Vatican's warriors and uh, close links to the Vatican, the intervention of Robert Kennedy for his father and uh, the role they played for Prince Radziwill and the appointment that Robert Kennedy made in the Justice Department to make sure that I.G. Farben didn't have to split off any of its particular holdings. A very interesting connection. What in the heck Radziwill was doing in that camp at that particular time? Who can guess on that one? Now, there were some articles uh, going back to Wiesenthal in a second, but apropos of him, not everybody accepts the fact that uh, Wiesenthal's conclusion 99.9% Mengele is dead is accurate. The Minneapolis Star Tribune has an interview sent to me by a listener in Minneapolis. It's from, it has a picture of my friend Brian Richard Bolin and his press conference. It says, Historian doubts the body in Brazil is Mengele. Minneapolis author and Nazi historian Brian Bolin said he once met Joseph Mengele in Argentina. Now, this particular person, I've mentioned him on the air many times, has been one of my sources for a long, long time on Joseph Mengele and everything they had given me 
or continue seems to fit into the Mengele that they knew, uh, he and Charles, and that I have uh, gone out and tried to tell to you in detail to you over and over again. He met, as I say, met him in Argentina. He strongly doubts that the remains exhumed last week in Brazil are those of the Nazi war criminal. This weekend, he said, the latest reports of the demise are part of a rather clumsy smokescreen to diffuse the intensity of the search for Mangley. Everything I've picked up from newspaper, television, and great radio clashes greatly with what I know about the man. I'm willing to adopt the let them prove it, it's him attitude. I believe he's alive and also beneficiary of an elaborate ruse which seems to be succeeding. Bolin thinks the ruse is a diversionary tactic to help him flee Paraguay, where the author says the 74-year-old war criminal has been living. As a matter of fact, I quoted on a program, I think around February, that airplane that left um, Ascension, Paraguay, and went to La Paz, Bolivia. No, it was en route to there, and it never landed. And when they found it in the snow, the remnants, there were no bodies there. And I suggested as of February of this year that Mengele could have been on that plane it was the day that Beat Clarsfield was to be r- arriving down in Paraguay for the first time, or maybe she's made many visits. And this plane took off and never went to La Paz. And interestingly enough, in the novel, he had to change it to a novel because his life was threatened. Brian wrote about a plane that left Ascension, Paraguay, and never got to La Paz, Bolivia. Now, one of the people said that Mangley liked to read stories about himself and these affairs, and sometimes the novel precedes the event, and in fact, the Central Intelligence Agency has a large section that simply takes novels, the ideas of the novelists, and makes them true. And uh, I had this on World Watchers about that airplane with not a sight of a single body. In fact, there were several people from the Paraguayan embassy and no record of any uh, funerals or remembrance services in this country, any person from the Peace Corps that was there. And I suggested that would be a way to leave, and it, they might have even tried to use uh, the novel of uh, Brian because he was familiar with Dieter Mengele and the nephews of Joseph Mangley and knows the family. The other possibility, I said, was that Mr. Giza Stammer, S-T-A-M-M-E-R, with his son, the captain in the uh, Merchant Marine in Brazil, was took a ship. They still haven't been photographed or seen. This has gone on now for almost a month. Next week it will be a month. They were to go to Singapore and Japan, and the easiest thing would be for Mr. Strassner to deliver them from Paraguay right into Brazil. There's a town and border, many of them that cross over, and put them on that boat and then send them to Southeast Asia or Japan, then fly them back to Switzerland or a convalarium or home uh, in Europe or in Germany, and nobody is going to look for him now. He's officially dead. So he says that uh, he thinks that this is a tactic to help him flee, and I thought of the two possibilities of fleeing, one in February and one this June. Boylan says Mengele has come, that they came to know as uh, a lonely old man is not the type of that he knew at all, and he's familiar with the family. This is the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, June the 10th, 1985, page 4A. He's not the type of lonely old man that would be hidden away for years with an Austrian couple. Bolin said his research and his meeting with Mengele in 1977 in Buenos Aires restaurant convinced him that such a fate would not be his style. He's a very gregarious man. He's not known to go hole up in a tiny town and live there t- for 10 years. He could use a that hideaway attic they had, and I'll do more on that later. But sir, Brian didn't mention that. I just say uh, there were places just to hide, but not for 10 years. He said he's a very deceptively cultured man. He likes music, opera, books. I found him fairly colorful in March 77 in Buenos Aires. We chatted about our favorite Wagner operas. Brian speaks fluent German. If I didn't know where he had been during World War II, I would have been impressed by his knowledge and charm. Uh, he said knowing who he was, it was revolting. Brian, 48, said he visited what he called the German restaurant in Buenos Aires. He was doing research on a book for Mangley. The man he met, he didn't introduce himself as Mangley, but he was told later, and that's the purpose that he went there to see him, and it was confirmed that he had, in fact, met Mangley. It isn't in this article, but he gave the name to me of that Mr. Von Oven, Goebbels' secretary who arranged these meetings, and Von Oven's name is mentioned in Lattice Las Farago's book, Aftermath. Brian, who grew up in Chicago, has studied and researched Nazi war criminals since 1974 
1983, he wrote Final Trace, the story about the Auschwitz survivor who spent his life tracking Nazi war criminals. At no time has interest in Mengele been as high as in the last three or four months. And I, uh, this is from the Minneapolis paper, and I credit that to Brian and Charles for making the connections of William Hetrick or the allegations or the things to look into and following the bank accounts of Mengele. I think they finally were the ones that stirred up this interest. Bolin said it really smells hokey. German authorities being unable to obtain vital statistics and fingerprints or tooth records struck me as very odd because I have documents showing the exact height, weight, and dental records, and he's holding them in the photograph. He got the dental records in 1975, along with a copy of Mengele's SS file from the Berlin Documentation Center. The dental records may not be apropos to a bunch of bones. I don't know if they can use them. They have only found three teeth. That is not enough to make identification. Then out of the New York Times on the 23rd of uh, June, the Israeli government said today it was reserving its conclusion on the identification of Mengele. This is uh, one day after Simon Wiesenthal is 99.9%. And before I get back to Wiesenthal now and for the next few weeks, I just want to interject a few of these articles. From Tel Aviv, international medical experts determined last week that the body was Joseph Mangley, but the Israelis have not yet withdrawn their offer made early this year of $1 million reward in bringing him to stand trial. The Ministry of Justice in Jerusalem published a statement clarifying its position. The Israelis had taken part in the investigation in Brazil. We do not cast doubts on the expertise of the pathologists, but at the same time, it continued, we will be able to determine our final conclusion only after receiving in Israel the scientific material that served as the basis for the pathologist's conclusions and considerable additional material which was recently discovered during the investigation. So that is coming out of Tel Aviv from the Israeli government and their position as of June 24th was they would wait. The the Benabrith Messenger in Los Angeles, June 20. Eighth has a story from Jerusalem, doubts on Mengele's death. Former Nazi hunter Isser Harel, I-S-S-E-R-H-A-R-E-L, who was former head of the Mossad, was instrumental in the capture of Adolf Eichmann in 1961, insisted here that Mengele is still alive despite the conclusions of a report in Brazil and, of course, despite the conclusions of Simon Wiesenthal, who's 99.9% sure, okay? There was no official government response, but a justice ministry spokesman said Israel was waiting again. And this goes back to the report. The Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles said in a statement they agreed with reasonable scientific certainty that the remains are Joseph Mengele. Uh, and also they agree that it was Joseph Stalin who made the quotations and not Adolf Eichmann. Just remember what they're mangling with history if you want to know how the Wiesenthal Center moves. A- another story from Menachem Rosak, who went over to Brazil. This was on the 21st of June, and he was supposed to agree with the case. Israeli expert insists Joseph Mengele is alive, so it depends what you read. Mr. Rosak said he's not so sure. The Israeli police in Tel Aviv said they don't believe statements and documents of Rolf Mengele, the son of Joseph Mengele, and uh, that Mr. Rosak has uh, knowledge, one Israeli agent, according to Mr. Rosak, and we had this on the air last week or the week before, said that I will tell you what the world must know. Dr. Mengele is alive. He's very sick and has cancer, but he's alive. The agent identified as Motti, M-O-T-T-I, of the Mossad, took pictures of Joseph Mengele in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, in June of 1980. The government didn't change hands for another year in Bolivia. This was the height of the Klaus Barbie CIA Mengele drug traffic, which was recognized by our CIA reports in 1979, heavily involved with the cocaine traffic, and I said now they would have to officially bury Mengele when the CIA was making the connections of the cocaine. Mengele was in Santa Cruz, and they took pictures. Well, the Mossad took pictures of Joseph Mengele, and uh, Mr. Boylan was sitting with Mengele at a given time, and these various agents have used this information to pursue the case 
Why would they put that time and energy? The Mossad could easily have found that the family wasn't corresponding or communicating or that there were no bank accounts in Switzerland. And as I said before last week or the week before, when Mr. Strauss from Bavaria went to Israel in 1984, he was asked by the Mossad, did you put money into the Swiss bank of Joseph Mengele? If the Mossad asked about a Swiss bank in 1984 and asked Mr. Strauss, Helmut Strauss, the strong Nazi from Bavaria about that, they certainly don't believe that Mengele is dead. This story that goes on, this is from the Heritage, a Jewish newspaper in Los Angeles, a wire service from Israel. Mossad reported that Mengele was seen after Bolivia, after 1980, in Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, and that he is now living in Paraguay, according to Mahdi's statements, and those were quoted in the German newspaper. Now, this was June the 21st. There is no medical or physical evidence that identifies the exhumed body of Mengele, according to intelligence and other technicians. Uh, the only person willing to go on record that the body is Mengele's are his son, Rolf, and Romeo Tuma, a Brazilian police chief who is a son of Syrian immigrants. And we'll go in more into Tuma, and I did a little bit in the past few weeks, and the link down to San Paulo, Brazil, the deal that Wiesenthal cut. I don't have time to do uh, all of, even a fraction of what I have here that I want to share with you, but I'm purposely going slowly. Another article out of the New York Times, this was June 15th, the week before the conclusions, Nazi Hunter believes Mengele is still alive. Tuvia Fried, Frieden, F-R-I-E-D-A-N, a renowned Nazi hunter who helped war criminal Eichmann to trial, expressed skepticism pardon me, that the corpse exhumed from the Brazilian cemetery was Mengele. I believe he is still alive. According to Friedman, the advanced date of decomposition decompos- indicates that the corpse was buried before 1979, when Mangley is said to have drowned, this is not the body of Mangley because such a body would have to be in a grave for 20 years. That would make it 1959 that this body was in the grave. Now, in 1961, in 1961, Mrs. Gerhardt was buried in the grave. I mentioned her last week with the hip story and the Wiesenthal connections to the hip. Mrs. Wolfgang Gerhardt's mother, Frederica, was put in a grave with a broken hip. Well, there's not much difference, I suppose, between 59 and 61 when the grandchildren said that the grave of Joseph Mengele was the same as their grandmother's, even though when they dug it up, they claimed it wasn't. But it could have been that they used that old lady's bones Who knows what these stones were over the grave or if anybody knew where the stone was and just put one over there and that was actually where she was buried. Friedman said reports that Mangley broke a hip before leaving Germany are false and it's the Wiesenthal Center that they were true. Brazilian authorities examining the bones and teeth found in the grave are said to have detected signs of a fractured pelvis. Now, as again, it's the ways and falls that are saying, even though they sent the hip and the hip didn't, the pictures didn't match, they uh, went on, Simon Wiesenthal, particularly the next day, and said, I helped supply the information of the hip, and yet the physical evidence didn't match, and even the investigators, he was willing to do it and take credit for it, as he tried to take credit for Mr. Stengel and Adolf Eichmann, and now he wants credit for this. Uh, citing a document he said was found in Mengele's SS file in Berlin, Friedman said in a 1943 court report of a motorcycle ex- accident involving Mengele, there was no re- medical reference to a broken hip at all. The SS, I use the word hip, but it, in the report it says a broken pelvis. And uh, Mr. Friedman and Rabbi Mark H. Tannenbaum, T A N E N B A U M, of the American Jewish Committee, noted the evidence found in Brazil contradicts reports that place Mengele in Paraguay. According to new accounts, he never left Brazil. Either the international intelligence community has been lying about Mengele's uh, whereabouts for 18 years, rather, or this is a gigantic hoax on the international community, especially the Jewish community. Now, and finally, finally, I don't think I have too much time to go into it. There were reports that when this body was dug up, the body was mutilated. The June 18th report from Miami Herald sent to me, thanks to David Miller, a great researcher, San Paulo, Brazil, the body suspected to be Joseph Mengele uh, was deformed. The cavity, the cadaver may have been deformed, and they said that it came from outside forces. 
that there was accelerated erosion of the skeletal remains and they're not sure how they got there. I might have mentioned this to you before. They said the head isn't normal. When the bones were unearthed, they were broken, including the facial bones, and they couldn't figure out uh, uh, about the condition of the head. Another story, June 18th, skull bones in Brazil found damage. There was a hole in the head, and it looked like there was an abrasion on the top of the head, a hit on the face, unusual deterioration of the bones, including the face. Some facial bones were in poor condition, a small hole found under the left eye and the skull. Well, is it any wonder, given the track record of the police chief there, uh, Mr. Toma, Romeo Toma, who was in charge of the death squads. Uh, I've mentioned him before, in charge of torturing, extracting information out of people, because Toma is to work again with Simon Wiesenthal later. So it's important to know that uh, while all of the changes of the body were being described, the case was getting closed. Now, one day before the case was closed officially, it came at about 2 in the morning on the 21st, of June, June 19th, 1985, San Francisco Chronicle has a wire service, UPI. Experts need more records to identify the mangly bones. I'll have to go into this because uh, it's a good point to leave off. I've got to go back to it later. The Wiesenthal Center or offering what may have been a fractured pelvis fra picture of that pelvic area. Again, because 24 hours... Before the case is to be over, they said we don't have enough records to identify the bones. So what happened in 24 hours that Simon Wiesenthal made, well, became 99.9% .9 sure when down there they were saying, help us, we don't have the information. I have to quit now. The time is over. But in the next week, we'll begin with that article because uh, it's important to the key of Simon Wiesenthal, then get back to the biography of Simon Wiesenthal and where he was during the war years and after. This is May Bressel from World Watchers, and we'll continue with this next week.